So the final speaking uh, speaker for the morning is uh, Alvaro Herraez from uh, SACLE, and he's talking about the emergence proposal in string theory and the species scale. Okay, thank you. So let me, of course, begin by thanking Fernando, Luis, and Angel for putting this nice conference together. And of course, for giving me the opportunity to come back to Madrid and present my work here. So today I will be talking about uh, the emergence proposal in string theory and the species scale, which is work done in collaboration with Alberto and Luis here in the audience. It's not uh, on the archive yet, but hopefully it will be out soon. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe we will also have to correct this line here, but let's see. But the, the, idea, the idea of this talk and the idea of this work is that you know, this emergence proposal that I will introduce in a minute has been around for a few years now. And I, I really find it very interesting, but uh, let's say it has been studied in some toy models generally or some simplified models as a proof of concept that it might work. But I think it really deserves some like more systematic, um, a more systematic approach and so on. And what we're trying to do here is to give a first step towards that. So trying to make it more systematic and study it in more examples and see how it can be general. So let me start by introducing what the emergence proposal is. So basically, like the, the, the current formulation, I would say it's something like this. So in a theory of quantum gravity, all light particles in the perturbative regime have no kinetic terms in the UV. You can make some weaker version, but let's take this one. And the required kinetic terms appear as an IR effect after integrating out a tower of states up to the quantum gravity cutoff, which we will take to be the species scale. And I will discuss the species scale. So as a statement, OK, I'm telling you this. You can say, OK, fine. The, the reason why this statement actually uh, appeared somehow originally, I would say, or the reason why I particularly find it very interesting is that it can actually give a hint or an an underlying principle behind the distance conjecture and the weak gravity conjecture in asymptotic limits in the sense that emergent infinite distances in modular space should arise from integrating out the towers that are actually predicted by the distance conjecture. So it's somehow like, this is not casual that you find an infinite tower there. It's actually the tower itself that is generating in the IR the infinite distance. And it is by just considering the, 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 the corrections, the, the loop corrections, if you want to the, to the metric. And just, as I said, one can just consider this to be strongly coupled in the IR, so no kinetic term here. And similarly, one can play the same game for a gauge couplings and towers of charge particles. So this is the formula, the, the general idea, the general notion of the, of the emergence proposal. And after integrating out this infinite, asymptotically infinite towers, one would generate the weak gauge couplings and the weak, uh, the, sorry, the infinite distances, infinite distances. So it's not, as I said, it's not casual, but there is a causality here by the, from the existence of the infinite tower. Okay, so the picture would be something like this. And from here, one can say, okay, the recipe to actually obtain these emergent kinetic terms, I'm an effective theorist. I have my theory. Someone gives me, this tower of states that are becoming massless synthetically. So someone gives me this tower of states. I compute the cutoff. I identify the couplings to the scale of the P4 groups emergent kinetic terms I want to identify. And then I integrate out the tower. I get this, this thing. As I said, at the level of the effective theory, you can just get it as a God given tower with some masses, some charges. Now, in order to actually check this and, and try to understand this in string theory, we're going to study different limits in modular space and so on. And we will be, have to be very careful about what these towers of states are and what these couplings are. And this is where actually the many interesting things happen. But let me give you like the outline of the rest of the talk. So first of all, I will just review the species scale very quickly to highlight a few important points. And uh, because this will play a very important role and actually as you will see, there are several cancellations going on there that actually depend on the fact that we use the species scale. So it really seems also from this point of view to be a right quantum gravity cutoff. Then I will just very briefly uh, make some 
let's let's say give you some quick calculations that like as a toolkit for later use so this loop calculation this in this uh, toy model somehow and then we will go on and do emergency intendi review emergency infinity what has been done and some extensions that we can have and i will end up with emergent potentials i will make that clear later so let's start the species scale I won't enter into details of the derivation. This has been already mentioned in several talks before. The species scale is just argued to be the quantum gravity cutoff, and it's just the Planck mass, but reduced by a factor that depends on the number of light particles in the, which are below the scale itself. There are perturbative arguments for this, from including loops and checking where the, at which scale the perturbative expansion may break down. They're basically equating the tree level and the loop contributions. There are non perturbative arguments about black holes and basically the, uh, the, the smallest semi classical black hole that one can have. But again, let me, instead of going into these arguments, let me just go and compute this in examples to really get some idea of what it is and why it is actually reasonable to take it as the quantum gravity cutoff. Ah, sorry, let me just remark that this log correction and so on we are not i mean i will include them when necessarily one can do it uh, we do it in the paper it's not uh, it will play an important role and but i will highlight one so let's start simplest case probably you all know this the species scale in the presence of a kk tower so let's consider a d-dimensional theory coming from a d plus k dimensional theory for simplicity compactified on a k torus there is the typical relation between the Planck mass in the D and the D plus K dimensional theories, the KK tower, everything is well known. And the, the species scale, actually, one can compute it. It turns out to be just the Planck mass of the higher dimensional theory. So basically, the species scale is telling you, okay, what you would expect from a full a quantum gravity theory. Your cutoff is not the Planck mass of the lower dimensional theory, but actually the underlying Planck mass. So the higher dimensional one. One can actually include finite, like the zero modes of the theory and so on. This won't play a crucial role here, but let me just remark it because it can play an important role in other, in other setups as for example, what was discussed by Severin yesterday about estimating it with the zero modes and so on. It's just the same kind of argument, just the species scale in different dimensions is the same. So basically computing it with the zero modes on the higher dimensional theory and the zero modes plus the KK tower in the other theory. So, okay, this kind of makes sense, but what about a stringy tower? And as has been argued different times over the, uh, uh, yesterday and in the talks, these are probably the most relevant results here because the emergent string conjecture also, this, is a, this should be the two kinds of towers that one would expect. So what happens with the string? So if we have a stringy tower, even by the oscillator modes of a string, we have this kind of formula for the mass. Okay, so it's uh, like the mass goes as the square root of n to the string mass. But there is also an important ingredient, which is the generation of each of the string levels, which for high end, for high level, behaves like this. There can be a monomial in front of here, which is model dependent, blah, blah. This won't play any important role. It can be calculated, but let me just approximated by this. I mean, it can be calculated and I mean we have calculated and nothing changes qualitatively what I'm gonna tell you now. So the picture is something like this. So we have first mode, the second mode, low degeneration, but especially when we consider asymptotically light strings, the degeneration of the highest modes will be important. So in the last step that enters below the cutoff that we call NS, this will be the equality between lambda quantum gravity and this level. And this is just the definition of the species scale where n dot includes all the states here. So one can just plug this in, in the formula, substitute this with the generation, count the states, blah, blah. And what one obtains is that the ratio between the quantum gravity cutoff and the string scale goes as a square root of this level here, which is this Lambert function, which asymptotically just goes like logarithm of n Planck over ms. So basically, this is actually something that maybe if you have worked with this species scale you've heard of. So the species scale is the string scale up to logarithmic corrections. Okay, this is what we're getting. The species scale up to logarithmic corrections is the, the string scale. It makes sense as a quantum gravity cutoff, but it is important to keep these logarithmic corrections to make sense out of the counting because otherwise you could come and say, okay, if I have that the species scale 
and the string scale are the same, then I just have, if you forget about these logarithmic corrections, you say, okay, but I just have zero oscillation states there. So like, how do I make sense out of it? Well, it's just this subleading logarithmic thing in this count. So it is, uh, as, as people usually argue, it makes sense to consider the string scale and the, sorry, the species scale and the string scale when there is this kind of string double dominating. But one has to be careful for some things when counting states. Let me remark one last important thing here that may be relevant regarding the species scale. And it's that in the presence of several towers, well, actually, typically when one talks about the distance conjecture, one talks about the tower with the lightest mass, or if there are two towers with equal mass, the denser tower, things like that. But if one wants to do emergence and integrate up to the species scale, integrate out things up to the species scale, having a tower with a lightest mass doesn't mean that this is the only thing you need to take into account. It's important to characterize all the towers below the species scale, because it can happen that imagine I have a KK tower and a stringy tower. The string tower can be like the typical mass scale, can be higher. But I just start with the lightest tower. I compute the quantum gravity cutoff. I get something like this. But if I only take care of, if I only worry about the, the lightest tower, I can't be calculating the species scale wrongly because it could very well be the case that even though this is parametrically higher than this, if I have a stringy tower here. This, as I start going up, I hit this tower. I need to recalculate the species scale and the combined species scale is here and not there. So, with this, I just mean that the typical formulation of the, the <coughs> sorry, of the distance conjecture, saying I should have a, a tower like tower with this mass scale, this is fine, this is true, but sometimes there is a richer structure there, and one needs to characterize all the towers that lie below the species scale at least for this kind of problems, for this emergence. Thing. Being said, let me just very quickly go over. Like now we discussed this, uh, we have some idea, we know so, how to compute the cutoff. Let me just now go to the toy model for the kind of calculations that we need. This is just one loop calculations of propagator. So for the metric that we had before, we just need to do this kind of loops or like scalar, one loop of scalars, for example, where this coupling only comes from the fact that the mass of the scalar that runs on the loop uh, depends on the modulus whose kinetic term it's correcting. One can calculate this as usual, depending on the dimensions, this can diverge or not. In particular, with this kind of coupling, this diverges for D greater than six. One can uh, compute this asymptotic behavior. This will be the species scale eventually. And basically we are going to use these results. At, at the end of the day, I'm after this going to go into the string theory setups. We're going to identify the, the couplings. We're going to identify the masses and plug them in here in this kind of formulae. And then just sum over the towers, that's it. So these are just expressions here. One can do the same for a loop of fermions. The derivative structure of the couplings and so on is a bit different. So there is a term that goes like this. There is another one that diverges for D greater than four, different powers of, I mean, different derivative interactions give rise to different powers here. We can keep track of all these things. Here, I'm just putting this as a toy model. Again, the details are not important. I just want to let you know that this is the kind of thing we have. We can calculate them, and then we can just plug our things in here when the right charges and masses are identified. But let me just actually, at this point, jump a step ahead and let you know that only with this and doing some quick calculation, one can right know that there is some kind of universal behavior for the emergent field, state, field space mesh. Why is there, is, is there such a universal behavior? Because of the universal interactions that come with the mass. As I said, if we have some mass, some state whose mass depends on the moduli, the interactions, the kind of interaction that comes from the mass term is always of this kind or this kind, depending on whether this thing is a, a scalar, a, a fermion, whatever. So the idea is that with this, one can actually take an arbitrary KK tower with this kind of spectrum and plug in this thing. This is, for example, for a, for a fermion, all like. This dependence here on the density, this peak would be thought as the K in the K torus before. The dependence, like 
somehow there is a, a balance between the quantum gravity cutoff, so the species scale, the number of states, and all this, so that this dependence disappears, and one always gets this kind of emergent kinetic term, which is nothing but the exponential behavior in the distance conjecture. One can do the same game for this, for a stringy tower. The same thing happens. This was, I think, for, for this kind of, of behavior for an arbitrary function here, but not, not for the degeneracy of the string, this was also pointed out by these people in, 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 in this paper, but actually for the stringy tower is exactly the same. And this is somehow in this sense behind the idea of the exponential behavior in the distance conjecture, by just integrating out towers of particles up, up to the species. But now let me, well, let me just mention that similar results can be obtained for the gauge couplings if they're like kind of PPS particles uh, with this alpha that we define in, in, in this paper. But the idea now, okay, I introduced the ingredients and in the last 10 minutes or so, I will go to the examples and I will tell you how this is actually realized in more extreme theory examples. So, okay, you give me this emergence thing. This has been done some, like this was originally done for this models and so on in four dimensions, but actually the first thing one can think of is, okay, let's do this in 10 dimensions, right? So let's apply our recipe, this idea, to 10 dimensions. In 10 dimensions, I, for concreteness, let me take type 2a, because I know both the strong and the weak coupling limits. I have a one-dimensional modular space with the dilaton, and I have two infinite distance points. If I go to the first one, this is weak coupling. This is an emergent string limit. I expect to be able to generate this kinetic, uh, this uh, uh, field metric for the, for the dilaton. So basically just this constant part here. As I said before, this is some kind of universal coupling. One can do this for the tower of excitations of the string, doing with their, uh, computing with, with their masses, the species scale and the, and the number of states and all that. Do it for the fermions and the bosons, both end up giving the same contribution at, at the end, summing over all the contributions, blah, blah. I get, as I said, this kind of thing, which with, for this particular uh, case, this thing, just one. So we get the emergent kinetic term. Now, the other uh, limit is probably more interesting. This is a strong coupling point. We know this corresponds to the compactification to M theory and the circle the compactifying to 11 dimensions. And actually, we would expect to generate this, again, the infinite distance, like the metric that gives rise to the infinite distance, but also this uh, gauge couplings going to zero for the one form with F2 kinetic term from the tower of particles that become light. But also there's this part like from the three form and we would expect to generate that. Now at this point, like and the, the idea we had and when we talk to people and so on, it's like, okay, not only particles become light in these limits, also other deep brains and so on become light. So, okay, maybe to get this, I would need to integrate, you know, somehow, should I need to integrate out the D2, something like that? What does it mean? Well, it turns out that the D0 brain from this point of view, which is just the KK modes of the M theory and the circle has everything you need. And this can be obtained actually by integrating out only the D0 brain from type 2B point of view or the KK modes from the M theory point of view. The idea is, as I said, from the type 2A point of view, this is the tower of these zeros with this mass, but the field content of a D brain is richer than just taking the D brain as some thing with some mass. And actually, well, one can argue this in many different ways. Like, well, one can directly go and try to quantize the world line action for the for the for the D zero brain. Or again, one can just take 11 dimensional in theory and reduce. The idea is the field content is all the KK modes of the field content of 11 dimensional M theory. So basically, from the, or from the fact that this is a VPS object, it must have the same number of degrees of freedom as, um, as a massless multiplet. It is massive. So basically, like this thing combines with this thing and this thing to give a massive graviton, a massive three form, massive gravitinos. But at the end of the day, we have the, KK, the full KK type if you want, from 11 to 10 of all these guys. And in particular, for example, these guys and these guys, the massive modes coupled to these things. So we just need to go ahead and integrate out these towers. You can calculate the associated quantum gravity scale, the associated number of species, 
we need to identify the couplings. In particular, as, I, as we said before, this is universal, but these two, we need to identify the couplings. We need to go to the theory, we reduce it, we identify the couplings. This is what one gets, this is from the gravitino part, for the C1, for example, from the gravitino part, from the, from the massive gravitino part, from the massive three form. One gets the same actually for both, one can compute it, it gives the right kinetic term. For the C3, as we said, there is this interaction and there is this interaction, they give the similar vertices, one can integrate them out, and one again gets the right kinetic term. So this is like the, the main message here is probably the fact that integrating out these things uh, and just really focusing on the, on the field content that is, we think that is zero from the point of view of Tendi is enough to get emergence for all these kinetic terms. Now, one can do the same with the, with the scalar, as he said, one gets the right thing. Now, Tendi, we can do similar things for the limits in which the tower is well understood. As I said, we can do this when we can actually identify the couplings properly. But let me now very quickly recap what emergence in 4D has been so far, because this is, I think, well, like one of the first calculations for the emergence of the uh, field metrics was, was made. So for, concrete, for concreteness, let's take type 2A on a threefold, on a Calabria of threefold. This is mirror to the type 2B setup. There, there was the tower of states identified by uh, these people to be this tower of D2s, D0s, uh, sorry, actually bound states of D2s and D0s with fixed D2 charge and arbitrarily high D0 charge. This is important. Why is this uh, state allowed from the point of view of the species scale? Well, well, actually, as I said, you have a lighter tower, you have the D0s, because actually going to the large volume in this point actually corresponds to going from 4D to 5, from 4D type 2A on the threefold to 5DM theory on the same threefold. This is not some other fancy decompactification or anything. This is just going to this, uh, to this, uh, to the 5D uh, theory coming from M theory. And the D2, D0s are the KK modes of the M2 brain. That is also the usual KK modes of the other fields in the five dimensional M theory that are encoded by the D0. And the reason, like if you calculate the species scale with those, what you obtain is that it's actually of the same order as the D2, the mass of the, of the, the mass associated to the D2 and F2 cycle. So actually, that's the reason why you cannot in, integrate out, or it doesn't make sense to integrate out here an arbitrarily high number of D2s. You fix the number of D2s, or you integrate a finite number, you vary the charge in the D0s, that's what is parametrically large. And then you integrate that out, you integrate out the, D, the tau of these zeros, and this is uh, so. What what you have to take into account is that again, the field content is richer. These are the high mass, the hypermultiples that were integrated out by these people in different setups. There is also the these zeros. This will also play an important role, like in the next two minutes for the potential. But the key point here again is one can perform this thing, and we are able. So the diagonal terms have been computed by integrating out the tower of the two the zeros by doing it a bit more carefully. Okay. Uh, one can also get the off-diagonal terms of the axion dependence. One can reproduce the, the kinetic matrix, but this was done, like what we did here extra is this non-trivial part of the axions, but let me now go to the emergent potentials part, which is basically saying, okay, the way I mean effective potentials is because there is this dual formulation of flux potentials close to asymptotic limits that basically allows us to dualize fluxes to four forms, three forms in four dimensions. Basically, all the information about the potential is encoded in the kinetic uh, term for the three forms. So actually getting emergence for this guy here is enough to get the information about the potential. Then you just turn on your fluxes and you get your effective potential. Again. What we thought at the beginning was, okay, so maybe the three forms, they couple naturally to membranes. There are light membranes in these limits. Maybe one needs to integrate this out somehow. Well, again, the D zeros or like the M theory has everything you need at the level of point part. So again, this is the kind of kinetic term that we want to reproduce in 4D. These are the two three forms that we have, the ones that have like divergent kinetic terms. 
as we said, this is the same limit as before. First, sending like moving in vector multiplet moving space and in large volume. This would correct. Okay, so I guess we want to go for lunch. I will be quick. So this is the part. This depends on the volume. It's just the compactification to 5DM theory on S1, integrating out this tau. Okay, is the, yeah. Well, th this gives rise to this part, and then going. Okay. Well, I will leave this here. Okay, so this should be responsible, and we can keep track of it by following the tower of gravitino, for example, that coupled to these things for these two parts, and then the extra part that was not necessary before because there was no five four dependent term in the kinetic term for the U1s should this corresponds to actually going from 5D to 11D and it's integrating out this tower of gravity. We can do this like this term corresponds directly to this term in 5D so let's go from 11 to 5 to 4. We can do this integrate out the gravitinos we need to obtain this term which is just in 5D units this is the same as in 4D units so these two terms are the same or dimensional reduction. We can integrate out this tower of gravitinos and just do it for the volume for concreteness. We find the 11 dimensional couplings, we reduce them, we get this key inside. This is independent of N for the massive modes of the gravity. And this is actually crucial because when you integrate this out, I mean, when you sum over the tower, sorry, this just gives an N here, an N lambda quantum gravity cubed in five dimensions is nothing but the Planck mass cube. So it gives this K5 squared and this B5 squared comes from the vertices, there you go. There you have your emergent kinetic term. Last, uh, but well, one can do the same like for the, for the two because they have the same coupling. In 4D language, this should be kappa four. It's the kinetic term that we wanted to, to, do, to obtain. And now the other part, doing the same game on the circle in terms of the volume, again, one obtains these two vertices. Again, independent of n, but in this case, different from the C3, zero, and the, so the one that comes from the three form and the one that comes for the six form in M theory, reduced on the C, on the two cycle and then on the circle. And then one gets for the zero form, for the C3, zero, sorry, the volume for the other one, the volume to the one third. This is the emergence, emergent potentials here. So let me just, uh, well, I didn't have time to mention these other results, but we also computed the species case in all the 10 D string theories. One can again find, as I said, emergent dilaton metrics for the stringy tower. There is also this 6 D theory uh, example uh, by Sunjo, uh, Wolfgang, and Timo. We revisited this, we recalculated it with our uh, cutoffs and our estimations. One can. It's, it's a different calculation, and actually, it's mysterious why the, the two give the same result, but doing it systematically with our uh, approach and our calculation for the species scale uh, gives, again, the right result for this emergent genetic term. So as a summary, I mean, I could, again, go over what we need, like we got this action dependent part, the, the potentials, this thing with the, like understanding the string scale as the species scale. But let me just give you the three main messages, like what, like qualitatively, what one should take home if one wants to do emergence. So the species scale as a quantum gravity cutoff seems to be a key point, and one needs to characterize all the towers below it, not just the lightest one. Then careful analysis of the light objects and the corresponding field content is also key. It's not, I mean, that it's not our naive expectation or what we thought, but this is of course key. And then emerging kinetic terms can be obtained for scalars, p forms, and including these d minus one forms that can give rise to uh, potential. So that's it. Thank you. Questions? Irene? Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I truly love to see the emergence proposal work. So it's very nice. It takes some time. I can imagine. <laughs> I have some questions. So, like, for example, how much? Because I remember that. In the toy models, integrating out the scalar or the fermion was only changing numerical factors. Like when you give all the content, the field content for the D0 brains, the two brains, and so on, how much does it matter that you consider 
all the fields or do they have all the same the same parametric behavior if there is one that matters more than the others or? yeah so, so typically like two things can happen there is one part of the fermion contribution that can cancel the scalar contribution so that's why you can actually follow the leading contribution from the fermions and then for example that's why in the potential now i just showed the gravity because this is the leading contribution and if there is some other constellation between the, this extra part and the scalars it's just subleading or they can cancel partially cancel but also typically these other terms coming from the from the other parts in most of the cases we checked actually give rise the interplay between the different bosonic fermionic character but also the different powers of the quantum gravity got up and so on that appear because of the difference in the number of derivatives in the interactions and all these things once you take all that into account typically happens that they are all of the same order so it's like keeping track of what we learn like experimentally in these kind of uh, steps it's typically for example in these cases keeping track of the gravity is enough to give the, i mean keeps the, the the right contribution and the, the leading contribution so for example can you distinguish if you need to take into account bound states of d0 and d2 brains or is enough to have just d0 brains no so things like that for example so that's the thing so in principle you have to include all all the all the everything which is below the cutoff and for example for the for the metric case taking into account the d2 d0 brain bound state is crucial to to, to i mean for the for the calculation for the refinement of the calculation that, that that you did actually for this part here so taking the d2 d0 is key to get this thing here because this is charged under the d2 and it's also crucial to get this off diagonal uh, parts and then the d0 gives an extra contribution for example to this part which has the same kind of behavior so there's a, a an, an interplay there but then once you take everything into account this is when you get the the, the okay. final things i don't and know if, if i understand just to finish uh, <laughs> okay you also get the numerical factors from all like taking into account all the field content i mean not, not the numerical fact let's say not, not the not these sixes and all, all these things i mean the, this we are not keeping track of it because that would mean to go to the very detailed structure also the Lorentz structure of the pro of the correction of the propagators and so on this we are just estimating it and we're following we're keeping track very carefully of the field dependent part but not of the order one factors that come from taking the, all the traces and all this into account if it's a three half spin three halves spin one half all these things we are not keeping track of that but we are keeping track of the field dependence Hi, uh, yeah, very nice talk. Um, I'm curious whether you're able to give any description. You mentioned that there's this picture where you had, in the IR you have this dynamics and in the UV, it looks at the UV scale, it looks like you have a, a topological theory. Um, are you able to give any description of that topological theory? Um, in particular, I would imagine, my hope would be that no global symmetries or Kvorism conjecture or something tells you that it's actually a trivial topological theory of the UV scale. Yeah. Uh Actually, I think that's a very interesting question. I mean, I, I don't have much to say about that. I mean, it's just like the the fact that thinking about it, thinking of it as a, topo as a topological theory is more like in the sense that yeah, you don't really have in the UV. You don't need to have this, uh, you know, propagating degrees of freedom and so on. You only need to have the interactions and so on. But uh, I think it's. Uh, I mean, I cannot really say much. Let Let's say the thing is kind of independent of what you have up there as long as it's contribution so you have some strong couple thing or basically you don't have the the kinetic terms up there it's kind of independent for whatever theory you have there in the uv but i mean i think it's a very interesting question i cannot add much more but uh, i think it's definitely worth it yeah. thanks thank you okay so let's sorry we have to yeah, the last, very last and short and short answer, please. Okay. Uh, yeah, otherwise yeah. It would kill me. Thanks for the very nice talk. So uh, if I get an emergent string, I will expect to have higher spin fields. Mm. Can you quantify how they contribute in the loops or do you expect that they are subleading or something? Well, so uh, there's two parts. So there's the part as how they should contribute to the species scale and so on. And basically uh, we are just counting them depending on the mass that they have, some kind of uh, scaling of the number of degrees of like the number of different fields that you have there now there's the the, the issue of how they contribute to the, like how their charges like to the loops of the of the emergent gauge kinetic terms for the gauge fields and so on there uh, it's very difficult to, to i mean there are some for example for this 
in, in this 60 case I was telling you about, the, one can model it and there is some, again, magical cancellation so that basically you don't really need the, the, the structure of exactly what states in which step coupled to the, to the thing. You can somehow model it and the, the, the degeneracy of the states that couple to the things somehow drops out. One has to be careful. But yeah, that's that's why actually emergent string limits in the sense are more difficult because it's harder to find all the higher spin cappings to like the charges and the corresponding performs. Some things can be done, but in that sense it's it's hard. Okay. So let's thank okay. Albert again.